This is Justin Tan from Malaysia. And this is my beatbox story. All stories have a beginning and my beatbox story began with a TV show. I was like 8 or 10 when I was watching American Idol with my family and there was this singer beatboxer who went on the show and did something no one expected him to do. When I heard that, <laughs> I was absolutely mind blown. Like, how do you even conceptualize making sound, like just drum sounds, holding a microphone, doing drum sounds with your mouth? I was mind blown. That was impossible to me, but he did it. And being the curious child I was, I tried to imitate it. Okay, I can't remember what exactly I did, but I do remember that when I was young, when I was a child, my mom would tell, well, she told me that I used to really like sounds, like when we would drive through um, a puddle when it was raining, the puddle would splash, it would go like whoosh, and, and I would try to, to imitate that sound. When I was 13, I found the world of YouTube, and from there, I started looking up beatbox tutorials on YouTube and started learning the basics. So what you want to do is do the kick, the letter P, and the F, so it's like pef, so it's like pef, 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 pef. I remember watching the videos over and over again, um, trying to figure out how exactly they were doing these sounds. Dave Crow's street performance video was one of the first videos I watched that like, really captivated my attention. <laughs> Look at that, like, how do you even make those dubstep sounds with your mouth? That back then, without knowing how to beatbox, I was just... It wasn't just about making beats, it was about storytelling. And um, Tom Thumb, um, he performed at TEDx, and his performance was one of the major videos that left a mark on me. Music lovers and jazz lovers alike, please give a warm hand of applause for the one and only Mr. Peeping Tom. Take it away. So even though learning the basics like and like those kind of basic sounds was pretty cool, everything changed when this happened. So I first met you in 2015 when I posted a post to Facebook to invite people to a WhatsApp group based on beatboxing. Uh, Justin was one of the earliest members to join and he was uh, very mature, very wise beyond his years. Um, he came. He came in at 15 years old, and he had the energy of like a much, much older man. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't younger people be more energetic? <laughs> <laughs> so that was Teapot, the founder of Beatbox International, and together with Pulse Eight, we three have run the YouTube channel for about seven to eight years now. And it's a channel where we basically feature underrated beatboxers or beatboxers who just have something inspiring to show the rest of the world. <laughs> The Beatbox International group chat, it, it basically changed my whole perception of what beatboxing was because so many different things were introduced to me in that chat and I just took a deep dive into the world of human sound design. Okay, so if you haven't heard that sound before, if you've seen no beatboxer do that before, you're probably wondering how? Like, why? Why would someone think of pulling their jaw down and, 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 and relaxing their lip to, to, to make that sound? It, it doesn't make sense. But some beatboxers found out how to do it. And it's crazy. You can roll like this, like... <laughs> Being introduced to this whole idea of crazy sounds that you would never imagine being able to make as a human, I was basically sucked in and I couldn't help but 
just keep on going and learning, learning um, so many new different sounds. Teapot was one of the instrumental figures who really helped me learn things like throat bass, um, inward bass, and the lip roll. <laughs> And so with this newfound inspiration for exploring new sounds, I began experimenting. One of the things that, I, uh, that was uh, prominent about you is that you always experimented. And it was very clear to see, like, especially in 2018, the stuff that you were doing was weird, right? And some of them was nice, but a lot of it, let's say, was like kind of in a quiet taste, you know what I'm saying? Like mm. it was a bit weird at the same time. Like we kind of understood, but at the same time, it's like, ah, it didn't work. But again, I think just experimenting is is like, how do I say it? It's admirable. Artsy has pretty much witnessed my growth in the Malaysian beatbox community from when I started to where I am now. He was the one who introduced me into the Malaysian community and he judged my first ever live battle. But we are going to get to that later. Let's talk about the sounds I explored. Whistles. No, that doesn't count. <laughs> I began getting recognition for my wide range of whistle sounds. And it kind of all started when I discovered I could make this wheezing whistle kind of sound uh, when I breathe really hard through my nose. But... As you can see, it requires a lot of breath, so instead of going like <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't do it now. But um, I moved on to the whisper whistle. Um, it's a kind of throat whistle. Hello, I can whistle with my mouth. <laughs> Not many beatboxers could do that sound at that point in time, and um, being able to do it with this triple clock technique really caught people's attention. So I was developing my style more and more, and one day, I decided I was ready to share it. <laughs> this was a really defining point in my beatbox career, my beatbox story, because at that point in time, Beatbox International, um, they, I wasn't really part, really a big part of it yet. Um, they were featuring um, beatboxers from all around the world, a lot of underrated beatboxers and so at that time it had like 4,000 subscribers and that was considered pretty pretty big uh, for, for a small time beatboxer like me. I really felt affirmed as a beatboxer like wow I'm considered to be someone who has good stuff. <laughs> This video also really helped affirm uh, my identity as a beatboxer amongst my family and friends because um, having a third party beatbox international um, featuring me kind of gave value to hey, I'm not just someone who makes weird sounds with my mouth. Um, other people see value in this weird sound making as well. <laughs> After this video came out, I remember chatting with Artsy and he told me that you know, you came out of nowhere, you took the Malaysian community by surprise because I wasn't involved in the Malaysian community at that point in time. But um, I had all these crazy unique sounds that um, no one expected another Malaysian guy would pop up to have. And so after that, he kind of brought me into the community, invited me to join events and meetups and stuff. I remember one of our first ever meetups was uh, when I uh, brought you to Azim's house. Yes. Is that, that's yes. The, is that it? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. the one. Prior to that, I never really considered um, meeting up with people, Malaysian beatboxers in person or any beatboxer for that matter because, you know, they are just strangers. You start off as strangers meeting online and um, you don't really know who they are. And for me, I was a young teenager and I didn't really have my own transport and that would mean asking my parents but you know how you have this thing where don't talk to strangers and you know it's there's kind of this thing where it's dangerous i mean it is kind of dangerous if you meet strangers online and you meet them in person like you don't know who you can trust but you know <laughs> that aside eventually i stepped out of my comfort zone and 
met beatboxers. At that moment when I met you, I was kind of in my prime, and there, I mean, I don't. This sounds so braggy, but I don't. I want to say that there wasn't really much beatboxers who were at my level or above me at the time. Yeah. So, uh, so um, I don't know how to say, it, but basically, I wanted to find beatboxers who I can help along the way, and so there were a lot of beatboxers actually around your era. Uh, or um, let's say generation that um, uh, came came out and like like suddenly skyrocket like like you know they they started like making the effort to make themselves pop out and that's why I was like oh I needed to talk to Justin I needed to talk to Stitch I needed to talk to Hardzo because if the Malaysian scene was supposed was to grow into the international scene then I you know the effort has to be made like, you know right so. When I saw you guys do those things, then I was like, oh, okay, these guys have potential. These guys have some drive, you know. These guys want something, and I think that's why um, I, I, yeah, that's why I started to like co- contact you and stuff, you know. And so with this small beatbox meetup began my entry into the Malaysian beatbox scene, and it set the stage for an adventure <laughs> I was not prepared for. <laughs> For first timer, I think it was a very admirable uh, display of you. Um, I think top eight, like top eight, was probably one of my favorite rounds because it mm. was like, oh my god, like this, like I would say the level could even like, oh man, maybe it's too much to say, but personally, like, the way I feel it is, I could match like the international level. Like maybe like uh, at that point, uh, at that point, at that point, yeah, at that point, yeah. yeah, legit. This was my first time ever in a live battle, and and back then I didn't know how to command a crowd. I didn't know how to engage with a crowd. I also, you know, how you plan everything, um, prior to the battle. I was just trying to remember everything I planned um, in my routines, in my beatbox tracks, and trying to engage with my opponent at the same time. So yeah, not everything goes according to plan, and things just happen but then when it came to the top eight we saw suddenly this like oh wow suddenly he was like insane like the i the the structure right uh the you know like, <laughs> yeah. the very uh interesting style of uh battling kind of like a cartoon <laughs> like, i remember you got that whistle trap i got that whistle trap <laughs> i got the whistle you got a trap oh whistle trap no, uh, like that. i got a whistle trap i got a whistle No, it was the way, yeah, it was the way you said it too. It was just like, ah, ah, <laughs> it was just like that. It was, so, it was like, I, it, I was not really, obviously it was kind of like weird, but at the same time, like, I think it also showed identity. So imagine that, like, first battle, top eight, identity already seen, you know? Oh! So after battling Vickers, Stitch and Hardzo, I finally lost to Hardzo in the semi-finals. But that wasn't the end of my battling career. News about Armageddon 2019 has broken out. You know, the marketing has already started at that time. And then, you know, personally, I have already retired from battling for like the tr- for three years already. You know. But at that time, because it was the first time that Beat Nation actually have a tag team category, in Malaysia. And at that time, I saw that there was only one tech team in Malaysia, which is Palawan. <laughs> so I thought, no, okay, that's, that's no, that's a, com- there's competition here, but there's not enough participants over here. Mm-hmm. So I thought it's like, meh, why not, right? <laughs> but I think I, I suggested, was it me who suggested the idea to form a tech team? Or was yeah, it yeah, I think you did. Yeah, I, I was the one who pitched the idea. La. So I think at that time, you know, in our usual WhatsApp conversations, we, you know, I just you know, proposed the idea like, why not just do like a tag, you know, since nobody else is joining, right? <laughs> so even even if, let's say, the worst we do, you know, we probably get like top four, or maybe if there's only two, two tag teams, you get vice champions. Yeah. And we did become vice champions of the Armageddon 
Beatbox Battle Tag Team category, one of the biggest battles in Southeast Asia. Outside of battling, I also began performing more. So um, I remember this once we were at an open mic, me and my friends, and we were performing with a singer and another beatboxer. <laughs> Towards the end of her performance, we had performed for like two hours, just freestyling, having fun. And she started taking out her phone and recording us. And we were like, okay, let's perform for a bit more um, because she's recording us. Later, she asked to speak to us. And as it turns out, she was a lady with a lot of connections and she got us a gig at a restaurant and she also got me to do a workshop at her daughter's music school. This was like crazy to me at that time because I was 18 years old and I got paid to teach beatboxing. People were starting to see value in beatboxing. Non-beatboxers were seeing that and I started to see that. And this was really, really exciting for me. I had this one problem though. When I performed, um, I never really felt good about it. And I would be really, I would consider myself to have been awkward in my movements, being unable to convey the emotions that I wanted to, to convey, to tell the story I wanted to tell. And I think, well, in part it was because, you know, I was, I was just, hunched shoulders in not dominant and being like hey yo what's up guys i was just very kept to myself and i think i understand why when we speak we want to communicate an idea but imagine knowing what you want to say but sometimes stuttering jumbling up your words or not knowing the specific keywords that are important for you to convey your message i wasn't fluent enough with my beatboxing to be able to um, fluently articulate the ideas i had and as a result of that, I was very inwardly focused, focused on trying to get the message right, rather than focusing on what was out there, my opponents and the audience. Even then, um, I did achieve a number of milestones. I performed with a Chinese orchestra, performed with some international musicians. I won, well, some battles, yes. But <laughs> I, I did manage to make a name for myself in the Malaysian scene at least. And I earned some money with beatboxing. So that was like, whoa, Justin, we are going somewhere. And so with all this in mind, I thought to myself, God, is there something you want me to do with beatboxing? Where do you want me to go? I think a pizza just came for you. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? What is this? What? <laughs> what? There's a little what? surprise in there for you, bro. Yeah, a little Ooh. surprise. <laughs> Yo, <Yeah>. what? <laughs> <laughs> I never imagined getting a YouTube silver plaque of my own and it all started from just being proactive. So in the early days when you first joined, you were very, as I said, mature for your age and you were very proactive in the fact that you were trying to get people to join the group, trying to build the community up. You were asking for videos from shout outs to people. Um, yeah, you just got stuck, stuck right in pretty much. Yeah, I think the first time um, or rather the first few moments of me being more involved were kind of just asking, how can I help? And then you'd say, oh yeah, you could do this. You could help share the video to Facebook. I remember <laughs> there was one point where I was sharing um, with KT all these videos that the shout outs to multiple Facebook groups across. Yeah, um, I remember you're in about 200 groups. different groups. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think that many. I used to share around like 36 to 50 groups. So yeah, I think just looking for opportunities to help was uh, what helped me be more involved and I think you saw that and we said hey this kid he kind of has potential yeah let's just include him in the team <laughs> yeah pre that's pretty much exactly what it was you came through just as I said you were wise beyond your years so for a 15 year old guy to come in and just have that maturity behind him and to be proactive in following through with what he says he's going to do was this yeah, that was the biggest thing really. Like, you were very reliable. Slowly, I got more involved in organizing events, editing videos, and making key decisions with Teapot and Pulsate um, for Beatbox International. When we crossed the line to hit 100,000 subscribers, YouTube sent out a silver plaque. Um, unfortunately, only one person usually gets one of these. 
which obviously wasn't fair when it's me, you and Path that do pretty much all the videos and editing and everything else. So uh, between me and Path, because we both live in the UK, we sent you out the uh, 100K plaque, but sent it to your mother, spoke to her on Facebook and asked her to sneak into your room while we we're all on a live call. And she told you it was a pizza delivery. And yeah, the, the look on your face was a picture. <laughs> Bro, that was, that was crazy. Like, I... I thought my mom was being so obnoxious because she just. I remember the way. Room. I remember the way you were like. I was like, "Mom, <laughs> I'm on a live. Like, no, go away. What? What? <laughs> pizza from friends? This doesn't make sense." <laughs> <laughs> and then she just shoved it in my hands, and I was like, "Oh, oh, oh!" <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, you guys planned this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. In 2021, before I resume um, furthering my studies, I took the helm of organizing one of the biggest online beatbox battles of that year, International Throwdown 2021. So in terms of significance, I'd say the biggest thing that you've actually attempted to do, well not attempted to do, you did pull it off like very, very well, <laughs> um, was the International Throwdown 2021. <laughs> You a clown. I think yeah. I I think ninety nine percent of that was down to your planning and your <laughs> communication with people and everything else. I was in my final year of uni, so for me, I was just kind of a write off. And yeah, you took that completely in your control, pretty much. And yeah, I wouldn't say ninety nine percent, but I think um, once we got things rolling, just pulling everything through and everyone else was busy so i was just doing that talking with yeah. the sponsors making the sponsor videos reaching out to the judges making sure there's sound check I mean, done it would just be modest though because without you that event just would not have happened at all <laughs> <laughs> not at all <laughs> oh yeah i can't disagree with that <laughs> I guess, oh! Vino! Vino goes home with nine points won! nine to eight won the close battle just he won the battle point. by one point that was probably one of the biggest events I've ever organized, online events. And the moment it ended, like it was building up all to a climax. And when it ended, I felt so much relief. Um, I really put a lot of time, a lot of effort into it. You know, drafting proposals, sponsor, sponsor, blah, blah, sponsorships, packages, um, communicating with um, the people involved, the judges, the hosts, and just a whole host of other things that I never imagined myself being, being able to do. On top of that, thanks to Beatbox International, I got the opportunity to fly to Poland to attend the world's biggest, at that time, the world's biggest beatbox event in history, Grand Beatbox Battle 2021. We are chosen by the Swiss Beatbox team to go there and film or vlog the behind the scenes of the event and subsequently had our flights and accommodation paid for. I honestly wasn't planning on going that year because of COVID and because of school, but this was an opportunity I couldn't miss. I got to meet Teapot from the UK. Um, we had been working together for like seven years. We finally got to meet. I met several world-class beatboxers that like I always see on YouTube. I've never met in person. It's kind of like meeting celebrities in real life, sort of, yeah. <laughs> and then I also got to film Beatbox International content, which was so cool. We are going to find out how smart beatboxers really are. Three questions, two beatbox related, one general question. I knew what? I used to know it. Bro, I thought it's a hard question. Is that, is that legit? Okay, I've talked a lot about Beatbox International, but holding equal significance in my beatbox journey is Beat Nation, Malaysia's beatbox company slash community. Beat Nation, it's the sun. My direct involvement in Beat Nation began in January 2020 when ABC, the head of Beat Nation, approached me and asked if I would like to help out in Beat Nation in, with something like a paid internship. This would mean that I would have to juggle my academics, 
um, my responsibilities at Beat Nation and also my responsibilities as at that time CF president of um, the CF club in my college. Okay, so that was a lot. I remember having so much to do and so much time I had to manage, but it was worth it. Like, I have no regrets having worked with ABC and Muffin. Um, he, he came in around the same time as I did. Um, I learned so much about like thinking big, thinking out of the box, planning events, um, scheduling social media content, post editing, um, management, whatever. It's yeah, I just learned a lot, crazy a lot. Justin, not only he plays significant role on the face of uh, beatbox scene in Malaysia, meaning that people know Justin, like Justin Tan in Malaysia, but at the back end of the back scene, he also the one that actually makes uh, the vision of Beat Nation, which is providing stable opportunity for people enthusiasts, a step ahead forward. So with Beat Nation that we actually have right now, uh, the teams, uh, the one that we hire, the one that we might provide opportunity for the next one, it cannot be done by uh, without Justin before. So Justin is significant both side you know both side uh in in terms of beatboxing as a beatboxers and also as the back end that supports the scene it was definitely a struggle at first i remember the templates passed to me were premiere pro photoshop illustrator and i was not familiar with these programs at all and it was just like i was thrown into these um advanced programs and i had to learn everything from scratch and, and try to keep up with the pressure of creating this graphic by this date and having it posted out. And you need to do it because we have a content timeline that we need to stick to. That being said, it did push me to learn these programs at a faster rate because now I can say that I know how to use them and I know how to create things with them. And with what I learned, I helped create the graphics and edit the videos for several Beat Nation events like TCBB Online, um, Beat Nation Family, Beatbox Masterclass, Beatbox Jackpot for two seasons, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I remember organizing and hosting Beatbox Jackpot, which was this basically new beatbox format concept thing that we created to kind of keep the community engaged and active. Like Beatbox Jackpot is the, the one that I, I would definitely say that Justin play a huge role uh, on it because the whole systems event and then style is majoritarily from Justin ideas. Yeah, I think you really help Beat Nation grow a lot. We Nation would have been wouldn't have been in uh, the spot where it was if without you, because you were such a hard worker and you and well, one of the one of the one of the things that I cannot understand about you is that you do this thing where you never complain and it's so good. You <laughs> goddamn man, especially in Beat Nation where a lot of things are very underdeveloped and so we needed a system and you just did it all. I was just like, wow, this guy's literally like, you know, doing everything with patience, like one after one, right? Bro, if I were you, I'd probably scream every once in a while. Maybe you would, I don't know your best life. Maybe like after like, okay, thank you guys, thank you guys. You just like add a pillow or something, you know? <laughs> Who knows uh, how you manage your stress. But no, that's the one thing that I was so impressed by you, love. I think I just really like organizing events, putting things together, creating, and seeing the fruit of our labor come together and work out. Okay, you know what else I really enjoyed? Teaching. In 2021, I officially became a beatbox teacher. ABC passed me some of his students, and I officially started giving paid beatbox classes. And this was crazy to me at that point because Again, I started realizing that, hey, parents were sending their kids to get beatbox classes and they were seeing value in beatboxing. While I couldn't interview any of my students, they were pretty young, um, I did interview an unofficial student, Po Jing Ren, my childhood friend. I would say, uh, you, you did a very good job, like, honestly. <laughs> I, was like, I would say a lot of times, like, like, cause, um, like on beatbox video, right, sometimes they make what do I put it? Uh, they, they try to show how to make the sound based on their understanding. But I don't know whether it's because they are video and it's not a physical person, but when I, when I come to you, right, you teach me, it's usually first you teach me the science behind it. So after you teach the science behind it, and then, then I will like tell you the process that I feel something here. I, I'm not sure if this is the correct feeling or not. And mm -hmm. you, will, you, will, you will guide me through it, like analogies. That's really, under, really easy to understand. Like the <laughs> 
like pretend you're brushing your teeth. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, so it's even easy to like think about it and learn learn mm. through. So I I think you can, you you have adjusting has the way of putting complex beatbox techniques into like simple terms. Teaching has so much value. It's like taking something that a learner deems unattainable and helping them believe that it's within their grasp. Unfortunately, I had to resume my studies and go to the US, uh, come to the US um, in 2021 August, and so I had to stop lessons. But one thing that really touched me was a student texting me while I was here and asking me, hey, when are you coming back so that I can have uh, lessons with you again? It kind of showed me the value of being a teacher. Reflecting back on the lessons I gave, it wasn't just a teacher to student interaction, it was a human to human connection. The value of being a teacher is, is like you're someone people look to to learn. And they don't just pick up on the subject matter that you're teaching, they pick up on the values you share with them and you introduce to them as you teach. And so my entry and growth in the beatbox world really shaped my character and it also played a huge role in shaping my direction in life. So back in high school, I really liked sports. I was really active. I used to wake up like at one point almost every day at 6 a.m. or so to train. And at the same time, I also really liked science because I just am really fascinated by understanding how things work. I didn't know what field of education I wanted to pursue. So, well, science and sports, I like those. So, aha, sports science. So at that point in 2020, I had taken for two years, for two whole years, classes that would lead up to applied health science, a major in applied health science. But at the same time, because I started to realize that, hey, maybe there is a chance I can do a beatbox related job in Malaysia. And so I took applied health science as like a backup plan. You know, if I do a beatbox job and it doesn't work, then I have that to fall back on. But that would mean that I would have to do a doctorate in applied health science, that field, because if you don't have a doctorate of that level of education, you can't practice in Malaysia. So realistically, if I did do a beatbox job, I would have spent six whole years studying so hard and, and, and spending money on that education just to let it go down the drain doing a beatbox job. And so my parents brought that to my attention and asked me to consider a um, educational direction that would complement my potential beatbox career. I was honestly pretty surprised because that would mean my parents were asking me to consider going into a field that could mean less job security. And Back then, I was still pretty set on, well, my, my whole mindset had been configured to doing applied health science. So I felt pretty unsure about changing my major. But hey, parents, if you're watching this, thank you for that, because if not for that, I wouldn't be where I am right now. It so happened that at that time, I had started my paid internship at Beat Nation, and that made me wonder, God, do you have any plans for this? Like, is this an indicator that I'm supposed to change my major? And so I took it as um, affirmation um, to the direction I was heading in and changed my major to broadcasting and media production. But it doesn't end there. My academic counselor, Miss Kelly, suggested that I look up speech language pathology. I didn't know what it was at that point, um, but she said, hey, you know, you're, you like this doing sounds with your mouth and hey, maybe you'll be interested in this. And so I did research on it and I discovered that it was something I was pretty down to do. We had him in here and we were doing a beat rhyming kind of workshop and working more on the speech and articulation. And I was like, okay, Remy, I was like, do you hear how like, you hear how powerful and strong your beatboxing sounds are? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, you hear when you talk, it's like a little bit hard to understand. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, now imagine every single word you did was like beat rhyming, right? Like just as powerful as you beatbox, imagine that was your speech. And he was like, literally went, oh. I watched these videos where I saw beatboxers use beatbox as a form of therapy and it totally changed the way I looked at beatboxing. My whole paradigm of what beatboxing was and what it could do shifted. And in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh. And then he was like, for the rest of the year, he'd be like, goodbye, Miss Kayla. And in that moment, I was like, this works. This totally works. 
this is it, and I saw the breakthrough. And the why it was a breakthrough is because not because we saw it working, is because he went, oh, I get it now. That's crazy. Like beatboxing isn't just about making music, making beats. It goes beyond that. Mentally, it helps you facilitate connections between sounds, putting things together, creating. Um, physically, you learn how to move or you choose to express yourself in a way that you may not otherwise express yourself and socially you form these human connections that are just so valuable it's an exchange of music or messages in such an organic human way knowing this i couldn't help but want to explore this field of speech pathology and incorporating beatbox inside of it because you know if you have an opportunity to create um, and to facilitate um, people being able to find their own voice, to have their own voice, to be able to share their thoughts and experiences. What an opportunity to be of this service to people. And so with that, I decided to minor in speech language pathology at Messiah University and later on pursue a master's in it. But that's not all. Beatboxing brought about another significant change in my life. You, you went to study in the US, right? Yeah. One thing that I've heard a lot from uh, Stitch and Hartzell is, bro, bro, <laughs> this is how I started. He said, bro, 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 Justin, and confidence. <laughs> like he said, like, like, yeah, I don't know, man. This changed, man. He's a different person now. <laughs> That's what he said. I think I didn't have a lot of confidence on stage when I was beatboxing back then because I didn't know what stories I wanted to tell or how to tell them. It's one thing to come up with an idea and it's another to successfully convey that idea to people. And I think because I wasn't able to do that, I felt defeated. I felt I, I just lost confidence the moment you go up on stage and you realize that, oh no, there's just so much you want them to feel and them to know, but just being unable to do it makes you lose confidence. My focus was on getting the story right rather than telling the story. And that's what happened to me a lot on stage. But things started to change when I started using English in my performance, when I started speaking more. So one morning, I was looking up and I saw, well, or rather I heard. Birds, right? You look up and you hear birds. Messiah College, is full of scenery trees and nature stuff. But above the trees, Something the trees. I saw a bird of prey. Messiah University is a Christian university after all, right? So of course we have to have a bird of prey. I used to think that my performances needed to be packed with the best beatboxing I could do. But now I realize that it's more about who the audience is than what story I want to tell. This is because a story bears no meaning to people who can't understand it. And so I learned to speak a language that people could understand. I toned down on my beatbox complexities and spoke more in English, a language which people could understand and they could resonate with the emotions, the ideas and the jokes and stories I wanted to tell. I think you talk a lot more on stage right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you try to crack a bit more jokes, your stage presence definitely improved a lot more. Right? Because when you started on beat, you you didn't have a lot of stage experience, right? Hmm. I became a lot more confident on stage and enjoyed myself so much more. Woo! Oh! And I think I didn't just change on stage, but behind the camera, in person. Like, look at this. For the next one, shout out to Piratiban and Wanjui. And then compare it to this. <laughs> My point of view, I've been able to kind of see you grow from a boy into a man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've just seen you develop as a person into a more confident person, chasing challenges in your own personal life and also with the beatbox and stuff, with the events we've put on and all kinds of different things really, man. Like it's 2022 now and 10-year-old Justin would not have imagined 
beatbox having followed him so far in life and opened so many doors of opportunities. It's crazy to think that my whole life trajectory has been influenced by something that started with watching a TV show. At some point, I realized that beatboxing is something special. It's given me so many opportunities, helped me meet so many amazing people. I've had so many amazing experiences through beatboxing. And I asked God, God, is there something you want me to do with this? This beatboxing? And as I look back at my beatbox story, my beatbox journey, I've come to realize that that is the answer. This is it. The past, the present, the future. God, what is it you want me to do? This is it. This is Justin Tan from Malaysia. And this is my beatbox story.